on the margin. So um, I arrived in, in Sydney um, to work on the coupled model. So this model, the, the beginning was to be able to reconcile the reconstruction model, the thermomechanical model, and the landscape evolution model that you can see at the top here. Oops. So uh, I'm doing all this work. Uh, all this work is a part of the Basin Genesis Hub. So it's an ARC uh, funding center. Uh, I work with Dietmar Müller, Patrice Ray, and Tristan Sa at the University of Sydney. And but we also have different stream. Uh, Louis, oops, Melbourne Uni, ANU, sorry. Uh, Chris Elder and Mike Gurnist. And we work with uh, different industry partners. So the Basin Genesis Hub uh, has contained different streams. And as Roman explained to you, I'm the leader of the global research stream. And I will show you today how, like two examples of interplay between tectonic, ostasy, and surface processes. So basically I will show you two different manner we have to couple the surface evolution model with more deep uh, dynamics, so crystal dynamics and mantle dynamics. So the question behind is how uh, can we investigate the effect of the tectonic, including the deep mantle flow and a static sea level fluctuation on the landscape development, especially the development of the margins. So you all know this map, uh, this e map. So what you can see here is a the higher topography uh, I localized close to plate boundaries. And if you look at the seismicity map, it's the same thing. You can, we can correlate deformation and uh, plate tectonics. And so you can also correlate uh, correlation and mantle, uh, mantle convection. So in order to couple mantle convection dynamic, dynamic crystal deformation and landscape um, evolution model. The biggest challenge is that we need to deal with the deformation at different scales. So here I'm showing you um, a virtual planet, so mantle convection model. And there are some Earth-like characteristics that you can see. You can see the subduction zones here. Uh, the plate boundaries are in white at the surface. You can see the continent here in pink. You can also uh, see mantle plumes uh, in red. But the issue is, okay, we can say, well, you can just connect the different deformation equations, etc. But it's not so simple because here we are dealing with different time scale and different spatial scale. So in terms of motion, the motion that we have in the mantle are not the motion that we will find on the surface. Uh, for the rheology is the same thing where we need to do some approximation of the rheology when we model the muscle motions. And of course, the rheology that we need to take into account to simulate some crystal deformation, some brittle um, deformation is completely different. The grain size we are dealing with is also different if we are looking at a mantle convection model or a surface um, evolution model. And of course, we are not dealing with the same type of material. So uh, we are dealing with multi-scales and multi-physics, which induce some limitations, actually a lot of them. So I prefer to talk about this limitation first. Um, yeah, so I look like this panda a lot, uh, trying to deal with this limitation. So the first one is, of course, the computational resources, because it's really um, consuming in terms of uh, computational resources. But it's not the only limitation. I would say the first one for me, the first limitation is the simplicity of the physics, as we need to do different approximation dealing um, depending on what uh, types of model we want to create. So we need to do a lot of approximation of the rheology, um, the rheology of the lithosphere, as well as the rheology of the mantle. And the issue is the uncertainties induced by this approximation um, induce um, 
um, can induce some variation of the surface evolution, so impact the surface processes. But still, we need to look at the different scales uh, because if we want to be able to understand the Earth, um, to globally understand the dynamic, for me, we really need to try to reconcile all of that. So, of course, different scales mean dealing with different equations, but also different grids, depending if we are using a landscape evolution model, mantle convection model, or a thermomechanical model. So I will quickly introduce you the technologies that we are using uh, to do this two thing. So we are, it's the philosophy of the Earthberg group and of a lot of research group uh, in, in Australia and around the world. We really try to promote open, open source technologies. So I think the most uh, famous one that we have here is G-Plate. So we try to create some virtual Earths. We have the reconstruction here, but um, we also try to uh, design some mantle conviction model, as you can see here. Uh, we also have Badlands, uh, which is the surface process uh, code that, that we are using here. And we are using um, Underworld, which is developed by um, um, Tristan's team, no, uh, Louis' team uh, at ANU. Um, so you can find, if you want to use one of these tools, we have Read the Docs available for Badlands, for Underworld, and we have a lot of um, G Plates uh, website where you can find the data, etc. So don't hesitate to contact us. But don't worry, I will not open the Pandora box and I will not uh, explain you how all these different tools work in, in details. Another point I would like to, to do uh, before to really start this, this uh, presentation is um, I would like to make a point here that you will see two types of model, the, some simulation here and some experiment. So there are some simulations is like this kind of model uh, I'm doing. So the simulation I'm doing are more uh, surface evolution models. So I will, I really try to replicate or to create er, more realistic models, but I'm also doing a lot of experiments. A lot of experiments mean, and it's, what you will see with the first couple of model is I know that these models are so super different. So it's like, I'm not like this rhino trying to be a unicorn, that the earth is the unicorn for me. Uh, and I'm just using different characteristics, which allow me to compare this model that you can see here with what is happening on earth. The major point is knowing what are the limitations? Okay, so the first couple model is that what we call Tectono Sedimentary Simulation 2.0. So I'm doing that with uh, Tristan Sal, Roman Boschet, and a lot of other people are working on that. So it's basically coupling topography, surface evolution model, and lithosphere evolution. So I will quickly um, do this different. Uh, um, first slide because I'm sure that you already um, heard Roman talking about that a lot. So when you look at the location of a lot of major sedimentary basins, they are localized close to the continent margins. So there is a generic link between geomorphic, tectonic, and sedimentological evolution on onshore region, but it's even more visible on, on offshore regions. So again, I'm sure um, you already um, heard Roman talking about that, but the erosion, deposition, and the tectonics are completely linked. Fluvial incision, mass weighting, sedimentation, glacial interaction depend on some reaction of the, uh, on, uh, depend on the lithospheric deformation, on tectonic forces, um, so, and, and crystal thickening, a static uplift and deformation 
are also impacted by the erosion and the, the deposition at the surface. That's why it's really important to incorporate both these phenomena and to really do a two-way coupling. So if you want more information about that, you can check Roman's publication here uh, in JOS. And so by doing this two-way coupling, the Underworld team developed the, the tool UWG0. And just to um, quickly show you that with this tool, we can do coupling with different types of model. The pull apart model that you can see here, we can look at the sedimentation too. Um, Roman uh, design uh, with a students, I can't remember his name, I'm sorry, some collisional models. We also have continental margin models and rift models. So if you're interested about one of these models, uh, you can contact us. So the first question is why? Uh, why should we use this coupled model? Because there is a really strong influence of the sedimentation on the deformation uh, of the margin. And I will show you that right now. So here you have different coupled models. You have the thermomechanical models here with the different types of material. You have the plastic strain um, of this um, plastic strain uh, field here. And you also have the surface evolution model coupled here for these two first models. So here we have a low erodibility. Um, which means that we, don't, we will not have a lot of sedimentation on the margin. So here you have the sedimentation in pink and the erosion in, in green. So you can see here, low erodibility, you don't have a lot of sedimentation on the margin. High erodibility, you will have a lot of uh, sediments on the margin. And you, we compared that with a model where we don't have the surface process at the surface. And what we can see is uh, here, you can see the, the plastic rain strain field the deformation here is completely different. So you can guess that here you will have way more fault and here the, defo the deformation is more diffuse. So I'll quickly show you a movie um, which uh, show the evolution uh, of a continental margin. And so here, same thing, you have the different types of material. You have the topography here, the erosion and deposition um, associated with the thermomechanical model. You have the surface evolution model balance. Here you don't have the surface evolution model. And so if we uh, add, yeah, if we let the model evolve here, you can already see that the, we don't have the same folds here along the rift and the pla plastic strain is different. If you don't trust me, I can show you here uh, an image which is more uh, speakable here. So same thing, you have two coupled models with different erodibility, so with different amount of sedimentation on the margin. And here you have um, only a thermomechanical model. And you can see the stress field here it's a cross a section at um, um, nine kilometers depth. And you can see that when you have no um, surface process at the top, the stress field is more important, which is quite logical because you don't erodate a lot. Um, here you erodate a little bit. So the stress is still important, but when you erodate more, of course, the stress decreases. So it's quite normal. Uh, you have the plastic strain field here, and you can see that the plastic strain is really low here and is a little bit less low for these two coupled models. You can see the strain rate field here when you see that you have uh, four major folds uh, for a model without sedimentation at the surface, when for a coupled model you have two major folds and uh, here for different, uh, four small uh, folds here, and here even more, six uh, secondary folds. So in conclusion, uh, the topography and the load of sediment allow the localization of the deformation close to the margin. And when you add the sedimentation at the surface, it induce, induces different timing of fault migration. So when you have the sediment, you, have, you may have smallest fault 
but you have more fault and the migration is faster. You can see that here you, uh, you start to generate this fault here, uh, this third generation of fault when here they are already there. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, we can look at the influence of the rift, rifting obliquity on the sedimentation on the mar of the continental margin. And why it's really important? Because um, I'm sure you all uh, saw this paper from Sasha Brun, which show that the oblique rifting uh, at the surface of the Earth, it's a rule, it's not an exception. So I want you to understand Okay, so what it induced in terms of sedimentation? Does the sedimentation change if we change the obliquity of the rift? But the first question I needed to answer is, okay, I want to look at that, but the first question uh, is, are the different phases of rifting visible in the sedimentary record, in the sedimentation record? So here, does this uh, low sedimentation rate induced by the rift bulge uh, or, or not? Can we correlate that with some uh, rifting events or not? So, oops, um, sorry, I'm not sure. So here is the one of the first coupled models that I ran. You can see the sedimentation in pink, the erosion um, in green, and you have the associated thermomechanical model below. And well, uh, the animation is not working, but uh, we are able to, uh, uh, to see the different phases of uh, rifting in the development of the topography. And yeah, so this one will be more visible. So uh, you have two cross section here, which will show you the sedimentation and you have the thermomechanical model here and so you can follow the sedimentation through time and yeah we can distinguish the initial phase of rifting the narrow uh, ring and subsidence phase the relaxation post breakup and we can also see these different phases of rifting in the discharge rate. So here you have a cross section and if you extract the discharge rate through time, you can see the dif these different events that we saw previously. You can all, we can also look at the different events like the arrival of the sea level, uh, the subsidence of the entire rift. So we can, the, clearly the surface processes model record the deform is a crystal deformation. And we can also look at the influence of a rifting event on the depositional environment. So what we did is we took the same cross section and we, we look at the different proportion of paleo death, paleo, different paleo environment through time. And during the first event of rift, we saw that we have more uh, short phase environment of course, when we have the second generation of rift, we will have a more distal environment. And then uh, after the breakup, when we have the, some relaxation uh, of the rift shoulder, etc., we can have more um, shallow uh, environment as well as more distal environment here in the center of the rift, which is, of course, quite normal. Um, but what is interesting here is you can see that if you compare the eastern and the western margin, the sedimentation is not the same. So we did the same thing for both uh, with same cross section here and looking at the uh, types of sedimentation that we can have, the types of paleo environment that we had on both margins. And you can see that here we have more sedimentation on the eastern margin, and it looks like we have more distal environment. So if we do the same cross section here, um, we can also look at uh, more economical uh, implication, let's say. So here on the western margin, you can see that you have, you have more shore face environment. Uh, and the connection is more important than on the eastern margin. You have 
more sedimentation, but you have less deltaic um, sedimentation and the connectivity is less important. So I did different tests um, with different angle of rift, so zero degree, um, 17 degree and 37 degrees. I work in radian, that's why the values are um, a little bit um, on a, yeah, 20 degrees, etc. So um, I didn't care about the timing. I was more, um, yeah, I really cared about the, um, the different phases of reef. So I look at the evolution of the topography here and erosion deposition here uh, before the breakup during the breakup and after the breakup. And when we look at the sedimentation here at the surface before the breakup um, and after the breakup for different angle, what we can see is when we have a straight rift, um, the, um, the sedimentation is more distal because it's in the, uh, the topography here is the difference of topography is higher than when we have an oblique rift here. So the difference of topography is less important and so we will find more sh um, shallow um, deposition and environment on the margins. And so I did design a um, more extend model just to be sure that the difference between the two margins uh, were not the difference in terms of sedimentation was not an artifact induced by my boundary, the boundary condition of my models. And I found the same pattern. So here you have, you only have the surface process part. You have the topography here and all these cross section here are some cross section of the um, deltaic uh, part of, of my model. You have the erosion uh, deposition um, field here and for uh, you have the straight rift here and an oblique rift and you can see for an oblique rift the western part here um, is more contain more distal environment than the eastern part here which contain less sedimentation and more uh, proximal sedimentation so we find the exact same result that, than before so in conclusion the we saw that the sedimentation records the different phases of rifting. So it's not surprising, but it's still uh, really interesting to see how the sedimentation um, uh, react. Um, then uh, we can, we also saw that for when we have different obliquity, it induced different timing of breakup and a different rift morphology. And yeah, I didn't show you, but of course the um, rift um, axis will change. And so the axis, the bulge, uh, the topography of the bulge will also change. Um, when we have more oblique rift, the difference between uh, the minimum and the maximum topography is important when, when you have a stripe, uh, is less important when we have a stripe rift. So if we don't take the obliquity into account, the topography, the difference of topography between the IGUS point and the minimum point is way uh, more important. So the oblique breakup generates more proximal sedimentation on rift margin. And another thing that we saw is that when we have an oblique rift, we have more drainage reorganization and uh, we have the, the spatial difference between the nick point is less important. We also saw that, oops, sorry. Yeah, both margin of an oblique reef contain a differential erosion and sedimentation supply, which induce a differential quantity uh, and connectivity of the, between the delta egg deposits. Okay, so that's, the first conclusion and that the first part of my presentation. The issue is I advertised about this talk saying, oh, I will talk about deformation at different scales. But I didn't take these scales into account. We talked about crystal deformation and the influence of crystal deformation on the surface evolution model. But I didn't really talk about 
how the mantle dynamic could influence the surface processes. So I'm sure you all know these types of models. So here it's a seed commerce model um, from the Baker and Fatina paper. So you can see the mantle here, the blue part in the mantle are the um, temperature, the low, lowest temperature. You see the arrow here showing a nice uh, convection cell here. Um, you can also see the topography here in, um, in yellow, it's the Tibetan plateau. And so the goal of this second part is how can we reconcile the motion we have in the mantle with and its implication on the topography. So you all know, um, I'm sure, the difference between dynamic topography and tectonic topography. So we will really oops, focus on the dynamic topography and the impact of dynamic topography on the surface. But to do that, we need to take different things into account. The first one is the tectonic reconstructions because we want to create, um, well, I work with simulations, which is completely different than the models I showed you before, which are experiments. So I want to include more um, Earth-like data. So we need to take the reconstruction into account here, uh, the, some mantle convection models and some surface evolution models, so badness uh, and, uh, and here you can see Tristan who created the, the code. So the first step is to integrate the mantle convection model and, and the, um, the plate reconstructions. And this allows us to have some dynamic topography estimation through time. So, and once we have that, the dynamic topography models, we can implement that um, in the landscape evolution models. So this is the second part, and I tried to apply um, this workflow uh, to look at the evolution, the landscape evolution of South Africa for the 40 last million years. So the first question that we uh, asked ourselves was how he, the expression of the mantle convection recorded in landscape drainage and sedimentary systems. So we wanted to quantify the erosion and deposition uh, responses due to dynamic topography in a more consistent way using the, the landscape evolution model. So the first question was, can we really extract the dynamic topography uh, signal within the stratigraphic record? And the second question was, when can we infer from stratigraphic uh, record the direction, the amplitude, and the wavelength of the dynamic topography? So to do that, um, we used a really simple model uh, like this one. So here you have the different um, elevation associated with uh, this uh, shield uh, model. And we just imposed a dynamic topography wave below this uh, badlands model. And so we found that, oops, can I just, yeah, here. Uh, here you have the setup, and we found that yes, we can uh, we can see that the dynamic topography model has an impact on the drainage for organization, on the sedimentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But more importantly, well, when we use this shield model, we realize that um, the wave of dynamic topography that we uh, imposed in this model, we could impose a wave of dynamic topography similar to the one who, um, um, that, that we can, similar to the one um, in, that we have on South Africa, that happened below South Africa. And we just quickly compared the sediment flux and we could find that we could compare the values. So. Um, we still need to be careful with this type of model because um, um, the estimation that we have done here um, makes it more like an experiment and it's not absolutely not a simulation. That's why you have different values, uh, but the pattern is the same. So I wanted to investigate that a little bit more. 
And I choose uh, to look at the influence of dynamic topography and surface uh, evolution model for the South African region, because it's a region where we have a lot of data. So um, the question I ask myself is, is, can we use the models to discriminate the best dynamic uh, topography model for the South African region uh, for the last 40 million years? And why for the uh, last 40 million years is because depending on the dynamic topography model you take into account, uh, some of them will allow the formation of the second South African plateau of uplift and some of them are, don't contain an uplift which could generate the, the, the this tectonic um, phase. So I choose to compare four different uh, dynamic topography models. So the model M1, um, Gurney, from ooh la la, Gurney, Mike Gurney's, I'm not sure, yeah. Uh, Mike Gurney's uh, backward um, advection, backward forward uh, advection model. So this model is based on tomography um, model. Uh, the model M2, which is a, SIDCOMS model, also a SIDCOMS model derived from the, the model M1, uh, the model M5, uh, and a new extended Boussinesque model that we generated using the new deforming mesh model that we created here in the by group. So, um, yeah, if I show you these movies to look at the evolution of dynamic topography through time, it doesn't uh, show you a lot of information, but now if I choose two different points um, on South Africa, here you can see the difference of dynamic top uh, topography through time for these two different points. So the plain lines here represent the evolution of dynamic topography on the Orange River, um, on, the, on the coastline here close to the Orange River, and so this dash line here represents the changes of dynamic topography uh, in the South uh, African plateau. So um, what you can see is the model M2 here and the model M5, which are uh, model extended Boussinesque approximation results. Uh, you can see that you have more variation of dynamic topography. Here, the value is higher. And for the two um, other models, the, um, the variation are a little bit lower. Okay, so if I want to look at the influence of dynamic topography, I first need to build the initial topography. And that's what is uh, quite new uh, in our model is we really create the initial topography and we are not using um, some already uh, generated maps like the Scotis models, etc. So to do that, we take the present day topography and we removed the difference of dynamic topography through time. So here is the dynamic topography model of uh, Musha because I really would like to test this one. Um, so yeah, it's a work in, in, in progress. Um, and then we need to remove the sediment thickness from the margin. So we, I used different, I did a huge um, bibliography review um, to be able to construct a sediment thickness map for the last 40 million years. And of course, if we remove the sediment thickness from the margin, well, it, influ it induced a deflection effect. So we also want to take the flexure isostasy into account. So once we have the initial topography at 40 million years, we also need to take care of the forcing conditions like the precipitation that we have uh, on South Africa for the last 40 million years. So here uh, is, oops, I didn't, uh, the, um, it's a figure from the Jean Brun's paper, um, which reconciled a different of data that you can find in the bibliography, but still you can see that there are, there are a lot of lack. Um, so I did the same thing. I reviewed a lot of paper, which allowed me to constrain uh, and to create different paleo precipitation map through time. I also uh, designed different um, erodibility maps 
because, well, you can see here, South Africa contains uh, a lot of different lithologies and of course granites uh, will not be eroded um, as, a, um, as a sediment or a sh shell. So we really need to take that into account if we want to uh, replicate, be able to have the same sedimentation at the end. So let's look at the results. So here you have the topography, the actual topography of, um, of uh, South Africa. Uh, here uh, it's the, the topography that you can see. The result is in meter and it's a topography. So here you will see the first model and the erosion deposition map. So erosion in dark and deposition uh, in pink. So when we look at the evolution through time, uh, using the technique I showed you after 40 million years, so you, we wanted to recreate the orange, the sedimentation on the orange basin here, and after 40 million years, that's what we observed. The only issue I had with these models is they don't include the flexure, so if I had the flexure in my models, uh, the sedimentation here is even better. So um, doing these types of models also means that we need to, and we can compare and constrain our model using the sediment budget that we have and that we can extract from the bibliography. So uh, here you have some sediment flux from Baby et al. 2020. And what um, we wanted to see if we can try, uh, if we can have the same sediment flux uh, in, around the orange basin that Baby estimated in his paper. Oops, yeah. So I, again, I did the same um, simulation than before. For the four, uh, for for four different dynamic topography model, and for my first test, of course, I imposed a fixed rainfall value. So here are my uh, four different models. So you can see the evolution of the topography of the drainage system in blue, and the erosion deposition um, in um, in yellow. If you see that. And so you can already see, if you look at the different types of model, that, well, the sedimentation here for this model, which is an extended Bucinesc uh, approximation model, is way more important than for this uh, model here. Okay, so now if we um, do the same model, but we incorporate the paleo uh, climate maps. You can see that it will change the sedimentation again, knowing that if you still compare these two models here with and with different um, approximation of uh, to calculate the dynamic topography or to generate the the convection, well it's still the same thing. You have more sedimentation here close to the Orange River, but in the same time, the pattern here um, and the different basins are not located in the same area. Okay, so it means that we might be able to constrain and co to compare the sediment budget. Um, so if I take the values uh, from the Babi publication here and I compare the the sediment flux I can extract from my model, here it's what I have. So for my four different models, you can see the sediment flux here. Um, it's a little bit dif difficult uh, to compare these types of data because of course, for in my models, I can directly extract the sediment flux per million years when for the uh, Babi's uh, model, it just compile all the the data, the earth data that he has. So he needs to do some package and that's why you can see this huge difference in terms of sediment flux. 
um, just one thing, all the variation that you can see here or even the small ones here are induced by the capture. That, so here for one model, you can see uh, you have a connection here in the river pattern and then you have um, a lack of co uh, co a lack of connection and you have a river capture again. And so it generates this peak here. Okay, so I showed you the result here when we don't take the climate into account. And you can see that, well, even if the sediment flux values are, we can compare the sediment flux uh, from my model and the Earth's uh, sediment flux, um, you can't really see this variation. So I was, okay, maybe it's induced by my fixed rainfall value. So what about if I use climate map, my climate map? So uh, again, I, you, I took the values, uh, rainfall values that I found from in the publication. And when I impose some uh, climate map, what I can see is, okay, I have way more variation, which maybe can be more consistent with this global uh, variation of sediment flux through time. So the only manner I can add, um, uh, I can increase my sediment flux through time is by imposing some climate uh, variation of, uh, of climate, variation of rainfall through time. So here you have a comparison of two models. These are the model M5 with a fixed rainfall value and with a, some climate map. So you can really see that the variation here in terms of sediment flux through time well, are really correlated with the climate variation. And so here you have the sediment uh, flux. So in blue, you can see the drainage, but what is really interesting is the model M5 here. It's the only model where um, here you can see the different catchment basins and this is the only model where I really see a difference in terms of catchment basins so a difference of drainage reorganization. For all my other dynamic topography models I don't have a lot of variation of catchment. The geometry of the catchments are the same um, if I impose a fixed rainfall value or, or not. Um, and if you compare different um, dynamic, uh, the impact of different type of the dynamic uh, topography, well, you can see that the variation in terms of drainage pattern is not really important. So you can impose different value of dynamic topography plus different value, values through time, it looks like it doesn't really affect the drainage patterns. So here um, you have my two preferred models uh, to be able to simulate the sedimentation around uh, the river, the orange, um, the orange delta, the orange basins. And these two models allow me to have the same amount of sedimentation and the same amount of flux, of sediment flux that I So um, to conclude on this part, what I saw, it's still a work in process, but for now, um, I can say that the dynamic topography model with extended boostiness approximation are my two preferred model. I can um, extract the the, the, it's the one uh, which have the, the best fit in terms of sediment flux to predict uh, the uh, sediment flux, but also the sediment accumulation, the location of the orange basins and the sediment thickness that I have in the orange basin. Um, I can also see that there, it looks like there is an overestimation of the late uplift for the model M5. Um, we also saw that there is no impact of dynamic topography or very low impact on the drainage reorganization because when we change the model, well, the drainage pattern is still the same. 
And uh, we can also say that the model can be used to discriminate the dynamic topography, but also the climate events. So it looks like um, the, the uh, increase of sediment flux that we saw uh, is maybe more induced by some climate events than by dynamic topography events. So what next? I really would like to compare uh, my, the result I have with testing the model of, uh, of uh, Musha. And I also would like to look at uh, the impacts that the different dynamic topography models have on the sedimentation on the margins, on the orange river basins. And I can compare that. Um, I can compare the stratigraphy in my model with uh, some seismic lines we can find um, in, the, in different papers. So these are the two types of couple model that um, I am, I'm using and that we use in the uh, Earthbike group and the BGH. But I, will, I have like maybe five minutes to talk about um, a new um, tool that we have. Uh, the name of this tool is a gospel or escape. So it's, um, it's basically like Badlands, but it's a global scale uh, modeling tool. Um, so you can, it's again, an open source, um, an open source tool. So you can already have access to that. And what we are doing these days is we are trying to uh, incorporate the reconstruction here um, on the mantle conviction model to be able to extract the dynamic topography um, values, um, uh, some dynamic topography uh, data that we impose uh, in our, Oops. sorry, uh, yeah, SCOTIS we use it. And yeah, so basically we can use uh, some SCOTIS data or polygon with estimation of the topography um, and we can incorporate some climate model to be able to predict this uh, uh, sediment flux through time uh, at a global scale. And so that's an example. So it's a backward for one model. Um, you can see the evolution of the topography through time for the last 100 million years. So we used the SCOTIS um, low resolution map. So we uh, in increased the, the resolution ourselves and you can see the evolution of topography through time. And you can see the associated erosion and deposition pattern through time. So it's still a work in process, but I think it's really encouraging especially because once we have the erosion deposition, we can now extract the sediment flux through time. And what is also really interesting, we can increase the resolution to look at the impact, for example, of sea level on the stratigraphy, because with this global scale, we can also look at the stratigraphic record, which means that we can test different things like the impact of uh, sea level, different sea level curves through time, the impact of different dynamic topography models through time, but everything at a global scale. So that's the end of my talk. So if you have uh, questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, we often say at the end of these um, seminars that it's a little bit strange because you don't hear the people clapping. Um, but I'm sure that um, everyone really enjoyed your talk. And um, if you have a look at the, um, the pictures in the participants pan, you will see some, some clapping going on there. Um, so the way that we do questions is that we ask people to raise their hands or um, put their question into the chat. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't see any raised hands or questions in the chat. <laughs> I have a question about um, glaciation. Do you have any plans to include glaciation and those kinds of aspects in your models? So that's a really good question. We have an uh, owner students working um, on the um, the yeah on the Ala, um, not Alaskan sorry on the Norwegian margin and the sedimentation of uh, on the Norwegian margin through time. Um, we are working on yes. Yeah, so, so it's a seventy million years uh, evolution model and yeah we have big issue with that so um we could incorporate uh, a nice module so tristan who is developing badlands had a look but uh, honestly for now uh, we the, the good point is we are working with industry partners so we are working with equinor uh, to do that, and they provided us some uplift rate induced by by the glaciation. So we we can constrain our model when we know the uplift. Uh, but yeah, for now we have a flexure model, but we don't have an ice model. So that's something we can't really know for now. We can't really do for now. Yep. We can force the model to react, like uh, you know, to create a forced uh, ribbon glacial ribbon but no well that's not something we take into account for now yeah oh interesting okay i have um brad with his hand up followed by um ju song ding so unmute brad yeah i was just i was just wondering great talk by the way um is when you do the uplift and sedimentation is the what you're eroding is that generic in other words is it just always the same or do you actually have lithologies embedded in the program so that sometimes you're uplifting granite sometimes you might be uplifting limestone or sandstone do you have that kind of differentiation in the model or is it just uplift and sedimentation just always the same well so for uh yeah, I, so for now, uh, in my model, what I do is as I change the readability depending on the lithology, which means that, uh, yeah, I will irradiate a granite less more than, 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 a, than a shell, for example. But uh, I'm not tracking the sediment through time. So I'm, but we can we can do that. We can say we can so we use uh, some erodibility map and associate um, a thickness uh, with every types of lithology. And so we can say okay, you can erodate this layer, but this layer is uh, five kilometer depth. And so after this layer, you will have another layer. And so we can really complexify the these models and we can take that into account but so, I, you can, so you can do it but you haven't done it that much oh i haven't because constraining the models generating the all the maps that you i showed you it looks like it's easy but it takes a lot of time so i didn't right. have. but that's Thank something you. we want to do yeah right. okay thanks um brad next is um Oh, hi, Claire. <laughs> Great talk. Um, lots of cool models and animations. Uh, I have a quick question about the, um, the set of uh, um, South Africa models. It, I, I'm not quite sure um, the initial topography map. So for different models, are they the same? Yeah. So the initial no. topography? No, no, no. The initial topography is not the same. Because um, now, to, uh, where is the, the workflow to generate this topography is this one. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the, oh, so you take different dynamic topography models and uh, yeah. so you get different initial topography. Yeah, because we really want to test a different scenario. Um, so if we want to be able to do that, we really need to either remove the dynamic uh, topography history. And so, yeah, it will, the, depending on the dynamic mm. topography story, it will not induce the same uh, 
paleogeography 40 million years ago. Yes, yeah, so, so when you compare your, um, your predicted, for example, the sediment flocks with the observations, so the description between the comparisons, would it be like coming from the initial topography or dynamic topography? What do you think? Well, I'm not sure I understood the, the question. Sorry, the connection was bad and just... Oh, I can, I can repeat. So I think in one of your slides, you compared your, um, your, your predicted sediment flocks, and then you compare with uh, uh, baby at all, their data for, I, I don't remember for which uh, drainage basin or for, yeah. So here, so there are differences between your model and the observations. So I'm just wondering, like the differences, would they be, would they come from the initial topography differences or dynamic topography? Because in your model, the, yet yeah, in your models, the initial topography and dynamic topography, they're both different between yeah. models. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So if you we look at the initial topography that we have here, for example. Yes, you're right. The initial topography is different. So yeah. of course it will induce different uh, flux because if you don't have the same surface that you can erodate, well, of course you will not have the same amount of sediment, uh, transported sediments and sediments on, on the margin. But that's also why it's uh, really cool to be able to generate different maps because the dy different dynamic uh, topography scenario will induce different topography especially in south africa i took south africa because well we all know that for the last 40 million years the tectonic impact was not really important well you know yeah. the, it was the dominant impact is the dynamic topography one so yeah it has an impact but it's also why we wanted to generate this um, this map because yeah depending on the dynamic topography model the initial topography 40 million years ago one was not the same I see. I'm gonna go out of order because there's a related question from Jia Shun who um, so Jia Shun would you like to, to speak up or I can read it oh uh, yeah I can speak I mean yeah I just wondering I'm just wondering how do you account for erosion during the construction of the initial topography? I saw you remove the, the sediment, but uh, the sediment comes from erosion, right? I, I think uh, the best way is to add back the erosion to the mountains, for example, to the plateau. So, I mean, do you get me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'm wondering how important it is. I mean, is it gonna affect your final results? Um, yeah, but in the same time, the erosion of the plateau uh, is induced by, well, the uplift is induced by the flexure, okay, if you're erodate. And I have the flexure in my model. Uh, we incorporate the deflex module uh, for weaker at all 2016. So we have an erosion, um, a flexural module, which allow you when you erodate to accommodate uh, the surface. But um, yeah, the main impact is induced by dynamic topography. So we have a combination of both. When we erodate, we have an uplift induced by the erosion, uh, induced by the flexural impact and we also have the dynamic topography impact. So I think I'm taking both phenomena into account. Yeah, my question is actually related to the initial condition, the initial topography. It's yeah. not the, yeah, after. So you, uh, your, all your results is based on the initial topography. Then you do the forward modeling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wondering. I'm just wondering how, like, the sensitivity of the initial topography to the final result. Oh yeah. Well, um, so 
Yeah, the first test that I've done is to use the SCOTIS uh, maps uh, um, for the initial topography um, of SCOTIS at 40 million years. And I just impose different dynamic topography model below, you know, uh, and let it evolve through time. And actually, the yeah, the, um, I could see some differences induced by the dynamic topography model too. So maybe you're right that something a test that I should I should make it visible, uh, you know. But for me, it's it has already been proved by the paper I showed before, situation paper, you know, it's like, yeah, you take a, an initial topography and you test different dynamic topography wave. Um, but yeah, I can also show that, but yeah, if I take the same uh, top initial topography, uh, so that's what I did for Scotty's and I um, add different, um, different wave. Um, it, I can see the same thing. I can also see the difference of flux. But what was really important for me is also to incorporate the, this variation uh, in terms of initial topography. Um, it can be a bias, but for me, it was also a manner to show what was the topography 40 million years ago if we take this dynamic topography scenario into account. But I agree with you. That's maybe something I should add. Okay. okay. Thank you, Aria. Thank you, Claire. I, I'm just conscious of the time, and I, I know that some people will need to go. Um, so I just wanted to make an announcement about our seminar next week. Um, so next week we have Martha Cloaking, and she is going to tell us about mantle temperature, lithospheric thickness, and dynamic topography, so we will learn more about it then. And she's going to, to look at it from the perspective of decoding the secrets of volcanic rocks. Now, I know that there are still a lot of questions. You've given us such an interesting talk, Claire, with so many um, different variables that you've probed in. Um, I can answer the first question. question quickly if you want, because it's super easy. Oh, well, no, so what I was going to suggest was that if people would like to leave, um, you're more than welcome to do so. And otherwise, we'll go to um, Fabio's question, which, yeah. as he said, is super easy. So yeah. Fabio's question was, besides sedimentation, what observables can we use to constrain erosion? Yes, so we can use the drainage, uh, the more drainage relative data, so the incision um, rate, for example, uh, to constrain the erodibility in our models. So that's something um, I had a quick look to constrain my uh, erodibility, and that's also why um, I decided to, you know, design some erodibility maps. But for me, it's uh, yeah the most important part was to yeah really for almost uh, the first time with these types of regional model um, to try to understand what types of sedimentation data we could use. So I know we can use uh, different um, different things like yeah the the drainage. Um, well, I'm more talking about the geological uh, part. So for example, um, we can look at the evolution of the drainage through time. So a lot of studies try to track uh, the evolution of the Orange River, uh, the Orange River geometry through time. Um, the, yeah, the alluvial uh, deposits, etc. Um, yeah, we can look at the incision rate, but yeah, I was, I really focused more on the sedimentary data. So sediment thickness, um, basin location, uh, seismic line, that's something I want to do after that, and sediment flux. Thank you. So we have um, another question from Patrick Ball. I don't know if he's still online. Uh, yeah, hi. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask because obviously South Africa is one of the few places where almost everybody agrees it's broadly up across the whole area. Uh, so I was wondering how applicable some of your final conclusions about drainage reorganization 
for South Africa are to the rest of the world, whether you'd expect diamond topography to have more of an impact over time in other places? Yeah, um, and I think you're right. And um, it's, it's, so the conclusion about how the, this, the model I tested, I'm not saying that, you know, um, it's a general statement. It's just for the dynamics model I tested. The drainage reorganization, well, it looks like the drainage reorganization is not really, uh, the, the dynamic topography model doesn't impact the drainage reorganization. But in the same time, uh, it depends on the types of wave, dynamic topography waves that you have. It depends on the amplitude and it uh, depends on the, uh, the duration. Um, if you look at expression paper, I don't know if expression is, is still here, but we looked at the reorganization of the drainage pattern, and uh, in his case, um, in her case, we could clearly see that the drainage uh, pattern was really responding to the dynamic topography waves. So we could clearly see a reorganization. I just think that the um, uplift, which are induced by all the four uh, dynamic topography models that I, I um, tested, are not. Um, big enough to allow a uh, drainage reorganization. And that's also why I would like to test uh, the Musha's model because the, the evolution of dynamic topography in uh, his models is completely different than the one we have for this M1, M2, M5, and uh, Sabine's model. Great. Thanks very much. It's a generic statement. Yeah. Thanks very much. Claire, I was wondering, your, your models show um, the evolution of the, the sediment pile over time. Have you been able to relate that to um, dates of detrital minerals? And so which units are getting eroded? Is there a special place you could go and, and test mm. some of these rates? Well, I, I didn't, I really didn't look at that for, for now. Uh, I would say that the, well, Tristan Sal already uh, published some paper about, you know, the landscape evolution of uh, Australia, for example. Um, but that's something we, we, could, uh, we could investigate because we can track the, the particles through time. So um, yeah, uh, we, can, we could do it. It's just that I, yeah, um, I'm at the early stage, and it's also that in terms of calculation time, you need to make some choices. If you want to track, uh, you know, the the entire source system system, so to be able to track where the source are and how the sediments move, the particles move, it also had a lot of computational time. So that's why I didn't do that but that's something we want to do in the future. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, that's, that's interesting. Um, any more questions? Not seeing any on the chat, all hands. Well, thank you once again. Um, I'd like to give you a virtual clap on behalf of everyone else. And um, really interesting work, Claire. Looking forward to hearing more about it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your nice comments. That's, that's cool. Thank you. So I'm just going to end the recording now. <laughs>